Thank you to the American Philatelic Society for their support in the making of this video. For information on membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. It's a stamp from China that makes its way out of the box and onto the desk for this episode. We can see that it is from the Republic of China, written in both English at the bottom and Chinese at the top, along with the value of the stamp, 15 fen or cents of the silver dollar. The image features a farmer reaping rice with a hall of prayer for good harvests in the background, a circular building that is part of the Temple of Heaven in Beijing. The building is where emperors used to pray for good harvests, so it's only appropriate to be featured on a stamp recognizing the importance of agriculture and the rice crop. It is a used stamp with a postmark, and I have to thank the philatelic community on Twitter and those who I reached out to on Instagram for helping me figure this out. It's upside down and displays the city of Hankou, which was a city that was established in 1921 until 1949 when it merged with two others to form Wuhan city. The date was even more complicated but could very possibly be 1824 March 22, meaning the 18th hour, the 24th of March, in the Republic of China era 22, which was 1933. That completely lines up with the timing of this issue as it was first printed in 1913 and this particular one was reissued in 1923 and used through the 1930s. The stamp measures 22 by 24 millimeters and is deep blue in color. So let's talk about China, not really a country that needs much of an introduction and you probably don't need me to get the map out and show you where it is. But after I pulled this stamp from the box and read up about China's stamp and postal history, I began to realize how fascinating and how complicated Chinese philately can be. And that's because China itself has a fascinating and complicated history, especially in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as China began issuing stamps. Now, philatelists are essentially historians. In order to really appreciate stamps from a country or region, you need to know a bit about that country or region's history. And the beauty with China is that its stamps very clearly capture that history. So let's do a very high level introduction into Chinese philately, starting with Imperial China. Going way back to 221 BC, China was Imperial China. Ruling dynasties came and went, and empire ruled by emperors. And it's at the very end of this long imperial chapter of China's history that China begins to end a policy of isolation and open its ports to foreign trade. To have a full understanding of China's situation in the 19th century, you really need to look up the Opium Wars and the opening of treaty ports. Now, at this time in 1844, the Qing Dynasty had been in power for 200 years. And because the dynasty agreed to open China's doors to foreign trade, foreign post offices started to open up around China's ports. Just 20 years later, Shanghai organizes its own local post in 1865. With all this foreign activity happening around the ports, a service was needed to handle and deliver the consular mail between the treaty ports. And so a gentleman from the UK by the name of Robert Hart puts in place a postal service to handle this mail through the Imperial Maritime Customs. This became available to the public in 1878. At that point, you could say that China had a postal service and the first stamps would be later known as the Large Dragons. These have an epic design. As the name describes, a large dragon dominates the stamp. China is written very boldly on the top in English, and they were issued in the denominations of one, three, and five kandarines. These 1878 large dragons are considered to be China's first stamps. Now, let's just go back to the stamp of Robert Hart. This stamp was issued in 1985 by the Republic of China, which is actually Taiwan, not the People's Republic of China, and I'll get to that. But this stamp commemorates the 150th birthday of Robert Hart, and it's a specimen stamp as it was not valid for postage. 
Eventually, in 1897, just 19 years after Robert Hart starts the Imperial Maritime Customs Postal Service, things get a little more organized. The Imperial Postal Service was established, standardizing postal operations between the local postal services and the Customs Postal Service. Stamps were issued that year, again featuring dragons, except this time they say Imperial Chinese Post, and then eventually, like these ones, Chinese Imperial Post. Remember, China was imperial. The Qing dynasty was in power, but was losing its influence over the people due to a number of factors. One of those factors being the same reason why China had started a postal service, the presence of foreign nations, and the other being internal unrest. The end of the Qing dynasty was near. Here's a stamp from 1909 celebrating the first year of reign for the new Qing emperor, Puyi. Whoa, hang on, I recognize that. That's the Hall of Prayer for Good Harvest. Anyway, this stamp is celebrating the new emperor's first year. He was just two years old when he became emperor. Well, he was the last emperor of China because in 1911, the Chinese revolution takes place and forces young Puyi to abdicate, ending his short term as emperor. This brings an end to the Qing dynasty as well as 2000 years of imperial China. And it's at this point in time that the Republic of China is established. Of course, usually following a revolution, you see overprinted stamps. And that was the case with these Chinese imperial postage stamps that were overprinted with Republic of China and immediately available for use. It wasn't long before new postage stamps were printed and available, one of which features a key figure from the revolution, Sun Yat-sen. He's known as the father of modern China and provisionally served as the first president of the Republic of China. Sun Yat-sen shows up in a lot of stamps from China and elsewhere. You can find him on an assortment of definitives and commemoratives. Even the United States issued this stamp in 1961, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Republic of China, which again in this case is Taiwan, and that'll make more sense in just a few minutes. Shortly after the revolution, really great definitives get issued by the newly established postal service that include the one I pulled from the box, a farmer reaping rice. It was part of a set of three definitives. One featured the Beijing Guazijian entrance, a university, and perhaps my second favorite Chinese stamp of all time featuring a junk, which is a traditional Chinese ship. These designs would be issued from 1913 all the way into the 1930s. The imagery on these stamps were representative of agriculture, literature, and communication and transport. Now, I really love these junk boat stamps. If you look very carefully in the background, you can see a train. And I managed to find a few of these stamps, but there are several of these out there. So I'm definitely going to keep a lookout for more of these junk stamps. Well, they're not junk. There's nothing junk about them, other than the fact that there's a junk boat on them. They're, they're, they're not junk, but they, yeah. Here's a pretty cool airmail stamp I found from the 1930s featuring a plane flying over the Great Wall of China. The country's first airmail stamp depicted a very similar scene. One interesting aspect of China's history around this time, from the 1930s all the way through to the end of World War II, was the northeast region of Manchuria. It was actually occupied by the Japanese and was considered to be a false or puppet state under the name of Manchukuo. The Japanese actually placed Puyi, who was, remember, the last emperor of the Qing dynasty, they placed him as the emperor of Manchukuo. At this point, he's an adult in his 20s and 30s. A puppet state is an entity claiming to be independent, but in reality, it is completely dependent upon a foreign power and pretty much under their control, in this case, Japan. Stamps were issued from this puppet state, and they're an important part of China's history. Of course, after World War II, Japan is out of China, and the puppet state is no more. Following World War II, a complicated piece of China's history takes place with the Chinese Civil War. This is between the government of the Republic of China and the Communist Party. And this had been going on for some time, but the four years leading up to 1949 saw the Communist Party force the government of the Republic of China to eventually retreat to Taiwan. And so we see the founding of the People's Republic of China as we know it today. Chairman Mao, the leader of the Communist Party, takes control of the country. And from then on out, you'll find the recurring imagery of Chairman Mao, the Gate of Heavenly Peace, Tiananmen, symbols of red books, celebration of the workers, communism, all of it. A famous error and valuable stamp that I discuss in a top 10 countdown embodies all of this imagery. It's known as the whole country is red. It features Chinese workers holding Mao's little red book with a sea of red flags and China colored in red. 
This stamp was issued for half a day in 1968 before a mistake was identified and then they were recalled and destroyed. And that mistake is Tai 1. Should have been colored in red, but it's only outlined in red. The reason why this is a mistake is because the People's Republic of China would have intended for Taiwan to be colored in red. And that's because they claimed and still do claim sovereignty over the island, considering it as a province, even though it's a stronghold for the Republic of China, who are actually the administrative government. The stamps that did make it out there are worth a fortune today, and the prices they fetch at auctions just continue to amaze me. No, these ones are not real. These are replicas, but I consider them more like space fillers, you know, holding the space in your album until you're able to get the real ones. Okay, maybe I'm dreaming a little bit, but just go with it. It's not hard to find a number of People's Republic of China stamps that have been issued over the decades from 1949 onwards. Here's an airmail stamp with, check it out, the Temple of Heaven with the Hall of Prayer for Good Harvests. More recently, the People's Republic of China issues stamps with a variety of colorful and interesting imagery. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, it's important to understand China's history because you can come across stamps from various aspects of its past. If you look at a timeline, you could be collecting the Imperial Maritime Customs Large Dragon Stamps starting in 1878, or from the Imperial Postal Service that was established in 1897 until the era of Imperial China came to an end, in which you begin to get the Republic of China stamps starting in 1912. Of course, there's that period of the puppet state, Manchukuo, which you can find stamps from 1932 until 1945 with the end of World War II. The government of the Republic of China retreats to Taiwan in 1949. And so the People's Republic of China is in power from then on as we know it today. Therefore, any Republic of China stamps issued after 1949 are going to be from Taiwan. And only as of 2008 do they include Taiwan. I realize that I haven't even brought up Chinese territories or administrative regions such as Hong Kong and Macau. There's a lot more to be covered. Now, when it comes to stamps from the People's Republic of China today, they usually just say China on them, such as these two zodiac stamps for the Chinese New Year. Ah, yes, zodiac stamps. This brings me to my favorite Chinese stamps. Let's discuss those in a different video. As always, thanks for watching. Keep a lookout for large dragons, Sun Yat Sen, junk boats, the Hall of Prayer for Good Harvests, Taiwan, Chairman Mao, and anything China. Also, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Subscribing is free and lets you know when future videos have launched. Happy exploring, and I'll see you next time.